on this lecture, I want to start looking at the chemistry of um, acetals and ketals and some practical applications of using them. Now, it turns out that acetals and ketals are mostly unreactive. Okay, so if I'm talking about the chemistry of acetals and ketals, maybe I'm not off to the best, uh, the most, the most interesting start. It turns out that for the most part, what we're going to see these these things do is the reverse reaction of their formation. The most important one. Reverse um, reaction. And that will give rise to the carbonyl, to give the carbonyl from which they were made. I'm going to call it the starting material. I mean, I guess if we're looking at this reaction, the acetal and ketal are the starting materials. But we're saying we're going to go in the reverse reaction, give rise to the starting material that made them, which was the ketone or the aldehyde. So let's say we take, for example, our ketal. So I've got this dimethyl ketal here. What I'm saying is we're going to do the reverse of its formation to give rise to the product. Now, if you recall, we talked about the formation of ketals. We said every step was an equilibrium process, ultimately governed by Le Chatelier's principle. So if we add a ton of the byproduct of a reaction, we could get back to the starting materials. If you recall, acetal and ketal formation was a condensation reaction. So what that means is that all we have to do is add a bunch of the thing that got condensed away to form the product, and that will make the starting materials again. Let me say that again. We make water as a result of forming acetals and ketals under acid catalyzed conditions. If we add back in our acid catalyst and an excess of water, our equilibrium will be driven back to the starting materials. This then serves as an important reaction for acetals and ketals because it's just chemistry that we can understand and control. So let's remind ourselves that the ketal or acetal carbon was ultimately a carbonyl carbon, a ketone or an aldehyde, respectively. And that what we did was we took that ketone or aldehyde and we added a bunch of alcohol to get the ketal. OK, so the takeaway here is we can go back and forth from acetal to ketal at will. We can easily go. back and forth between acetals and ketals okay so i want you to i want you to realize that we can go back and forth from acetals and ketals and ketals and acetals are unreactive huh Okay, so the only real reaction that I want you to worry about with acetals and ketals is that they can go back to the ketones that they were originally derived from, just adding water and a little bit of acid. Okay, it's an important reaction. Know it for predict the products and that sort of thing. But something else kind of comes up here. Acetals and ketals are mostly unreactive. That's in deep contrast to aldehydes and ketones. Sorry to flip the order there. Aldehydes and ketones are super reactive. Sometimes it's annoying how reactive they are. Sometimes I want to do chemistry on another part of the molecule and not touch the carbonyl, not touch the ketone or the aldehyde. Well, now what I could do is just simply like convert it into an acetal and ketal, and then it's unreactive. I can do my chemistry on the other side of the molecule, and then okay, that first conversion into an acetal and ketal was great, but the important thing is I can get back my ketone or my aldehyde so I can do a reaction on it later. That gets into the idea of protecting groups and masking groups. These are um, functional groups that sort of um, that that mask or um, that change reactive groups
into unreactive groups. Now, nothing is perfectly unreactive. So they, they convert a reactive group into something that's not reactive. They protect it or they mask it, they disguise it. So like if we had something that was hyperelectrophilic, like a carbonyl, for example, these things are pretty electrophilic, right? If we added an electrophilic carbonyl, we want to do some, we want to add a nucleophile to some other part of the molecule, we can convert it into something that's not electrophilic, okay? Like an acetal or ketal, these things are unreactive. Um, into unreactive groups. And here's the kicker. When needed, we can readily go back to the starting comma reactive group. Okay, so that's what a protecting group or a masking group is. We sort of disguise the reactive functional group so we can do some chemistry that it would otherwise not be amenable to, that would otherwise, you know, react with and screw everything up. We can disguise it as something that is less reactive. Okay, so for example, let's look at some examples here. Let's say you want to do a reaction of... you want to do this reaction. It's going to be a Grignard reaction and you're going to take acetone, great reactant in a Grignard rea reagent. And we're going to add the Grignard reagent, which I show as my Mg, usually adducted to Br to capture the second positive charge of magnesium. Now that car that's going to be atta attached to a carbon atom. Let's make it attached to this carbon group. Okay, so I want to do this reaction where I mix these things together. And I get this product after H plus workup. Okay, if I do that reaction as proposed, this would be my new bond. If you're having trouble seeing that, I connected this atom, which is down here, with this atom. And I have a resonance structure to account for why that reaction took place at that position. Okay. So here's the deal. This is a bad plan. Is it a good idea? No. The aldehyde on the Grignard, the aldehyde on the Grignard will react, and it will probably react faster, will react, okay? This is a bad Grignard reagent. You wouldn't want to put your nucleophile on the same side as, a, as an electrophile, that could react with itself, either two of them coming together to make some sort of start of a polymer sequence, right? If we've got like a head to tail addition over and over again, you get a polymer, or it could just react within itself. It'd be a pretty cool reaction, actually. I'm not sure if it could, anyway, it could react with itself to make a three membered ring, maybe, um, I don't know. Um, but uh, it's just not a, it's just not a good Grignard reaction. Like, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't start with the corresponding bromide and then add magnesium, expect anything stable to come out that you could even do a Grignard reaction on. So this is a bad Grignard reaction. How can we make that Grignard reagent better? This, uh, goodness, come on. Let's specify what this is. How can this be made? And the answer is, in this case, because we have an aldehyde, it's an acetal, but we'll use an acetal protecting group. And it's the, everything's the same for acetals and ketals. It's just different names based on whether we have a ketone or an aldehyde starting with here. Acetal protecting group. Okay, so what I'm saying is what we're going to do is instead of taking this compound 
and reacting it with, and maybe that's not even a great starting material in and of itself now I look at it, but let's not worry about that. Instead of reacting this with magnesium to give us this species, we're saying that's not going to be a viable route because this is unstable. It will react with itself. That's a good way to be unstable. Instead, what we're first going to do is we're going to protect this. Protect this as an acetal. Now an acetal is where the carbon that once had the carbonyl now has two carbon oxygen single bonds and each of those oxygens are attached to something else. Probably the R groups are gonna be the same because we'd use the same type of alcohol, that sort of thing. Okay. So then what we'll do is we'll add magnesium zero to this and that's going to give us This species where the magnesium slips in between the carbon mag, uh, carbon bromine bond and makes a Grignard reagent. And now this is stable because Grignard reagents have no problem dealing with, um, Grignard reagents have no problem dealing with uh, ketals or acetals. Okay, this is stable because now we are unreactive at what was our carbonyl. Sorry to draw that small, that says the word unreactive. Okay. So we have a stable molecule. So what we can do is we can take our stable Grignard reagent and mix it with the ketone we wanted to use, which was acetone. We can mix this followed by adding H plus. And now this position is going to add to this position and we get this new bond forming here, and it's just a typical Grignard reaction. So the um, O minus, which is probably countered by some magnesium that gets protonated by the H plus that happens during the workup of the reaction. Okay, so we protected everything and we got our product right. Hold on just a second. The key thing about the protecting group, and it's kind of why I like to throw in the term masking group too, is a mask is great, but if the mask never comes off, it's not so great, right? I mean, think about it. If you want to disguise yourself and you put a mask on so nobody can tell who you are, it, the, the whole purpose of the mask would be to also kind of take it off when you're done being in disguise. If it's forever on you, you just like changed your identity or something, which here we want to use the same molecules. <laughs> so we have to get to that target molecule somehow. So the reactivity is gone, but we don't have our product yet. So I just want to emphasize not the product. We're masked, we're still protected. And so if we're not the product, what we need to do is we need to convert this to the product by reacting our acetal or ketal back, um, um, reacting or putting it under such conditions that it can go backwards in time back to the starting material that, is, that it began with. To do that, we're going to have H2O added in excess along with an H plus catalyst. And that's going to zip through the entire reaction goes through the reverse sequence of events that led to its formation. And ultimately what we get is the same molecule otherwise, assuming that OH isn't gonna go anywhere. There's our Grignard bond. But now the acetal converts into the aldehyde. So there's our acetal carbon highlighted with a dot and we're back to the aldehyde. Now there's all sorts of protecting groups present. The acetal and ketal is a really popular protecting group for aldehydes and ketones. Now of these, the most practical acetal or ketal to use, if you're just looking to do a protection is the cyclic acetal and ketal. So these are highly practical protecting groups. Okay, so what's a cyclic acetal and ketal? We alluded to this last time, where what we're going to do is we're going to react this with an excess of alcohol, but the alcohol we're picking on is a dialcohol. 
In this case, I like to choose ethylene glycol. So ethylene glycol is a, um, an alcohol connected by two carbon atoms that in the presence of H plus, what we get is a five membered ring. It kind of looks like a person where we have the four atoms from ethylene glycol incorporated in to make a five membered ring. Now the fifth atom of our five membered ring is the carbonyl carbon. This could be an aldehyde or ketone. Turns out that ethylene glycol is readily available is readily available and um, uh, reacts quickly reacts quickly to form a cyclic ketal and the reason why it reacts quickly is that it involves an intramolecular reaction, a reaction that happens within itself. You don't have to wait for the collision of something that's sort of walking by or, you know, floating by, I guess, <laughs> in reactions. So um, anyway, this is a really nice um, uh, protecting group. It, ha it, comes on, it comes on quickly. It's easy to deal with. It can be easy, to, easy enough to remove. Turns out ethylene glycol is kind of an issue because it uh, has a sweet taste to it and it's in antifreeze. It's a really popular additive for antifreeze. And so um, many you know, mam mammalian pets um, may accidentally consume some that's spilled. Um, and it will, uh, it turns out that ethylene glycol will crystallize in the brain of mammals and that's, you, you don't want solid stuff in your brain. And so that's, that's death because it crosses the blood brain barrier and all of that stuff. I've heard, I shouldn't share this on YouTube. So I'm going to. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've heard that uh, if uh, you accidentally consume ethylene glycol, which antifreeze, and you're worried about dying, which you should be, um, nah, I won't even. Well, I one approach, I guess, is to consume a lot of hard liquor, as that kind of kicks your um, that kind of kicks your alcohol metabolism into overdrive and gives you a chance of surviving the ethylene glycol consumption. Um, yeah, it not not something to mess around with, though. Definitely not. Yeah. So ethylene glycol, big problem, big toxin, super useful as a chemical, though, readily easy to come by and that sort of thing. So anyway, I'll just uh, end my piece there. OK, so let's look at the mechanism for cyclic ketal formation as a bit of a review. Of ketal and acetal formation, just so you can see the opportunities that emerge for an intramolecular reaction. So the reaction I want to look at is if I take acetone and react it with ethylene glycol in the presence of an H plus catalyst. Now what you can do is um, start by letting the acid react first. That's the important thing to do, right? So here's our mechanism now. We're going to let the acid react with the carbonyl, this is just this is a mechanism very similar to one we've already drawn. Not too many differences here. Now you may want to consider the resonance structure to show where the H plus adds. Otherwise, you can take the pi electrons and let those add to the H plus, or you can let a lone pair and then show resonance structure subsequently. There's a lot of ways to depict this, but either way is going to get you to a structure where now we have positive character at what was the carbonyl carbon. That will now engage our poor nucleophile, which is the alcohol using the lone pair of electrons. Now when the alcohol adds, it's gonna carry with it everything it had attached to it originally, which was CH2CH2OH. That then gives rise to this adduct, which has an extra hydrogen atom. We need to lose that hydrogen atom to neutralize the positive charge on the oxygen while simultaneously providing us an H plus to kick, kick us through the next stage of the reaction. Now, it's important to note that at this stage, we've got a hemi ketal in this case, a carbon with an OH on one side and an OR on the other side. Okay, so that's going to engage the H plus that's floating around.
And that's going to make the OH, um, the OH that's on the hemiacetyl carb. Remember, it could go to a lot of those oxygens, but it's going to pick the one that actually gives rise to product. So at this point, we could let the lone pair push us off, or we could let the, o, the H2O fall off as a good leaving group. That's going to give rise to this species now with a carbon at this position. It was here in previous mechanisms that we waited for another alcohol molecule to come around and neutralize that positive charge. Here, that other alcohol is going to be the other oxygen atom on ethylene glycol. And this is our fast intramolecular reaction within the molecule. You know, for somebody that spends so much time thinking about molecules, I sure, you know, have trouble sometimes because I'm writing too fast spelling molecular. <laughs> okay, when that oxygen adds, we now have an oxygen with a positive charge because it adds an extra hydrogen. We just need to lose that hydrogen, regenerate our acid catalyst, and form our cyclic, in this case, ketal. Because same thing could work for acetals. Okay. Um, so I think, uh, I think I'll stop here. We'll talk a little bit more about this and some other protecting strategies um, next time. But suffice it to say, this is a good stopping point for now. So um, yeah, I guess you know, we'll see you next time.